for uh, the ministry of your word this morning. We acknowledge that, that, that your word is able to make us wise unto salvation. We lift up the name of the Lord over this portion of our gathering. And in Jesus' name, we take authority over every uh, contrary will, every demonic force, every territorial spirit, every demonic uh, influence. And we render you powerless. We say you are bound in the name of Jesus, and we forbid you to interfere with the ministry of the word of the king this morning. And Lord, we we acknowledge that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so we ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. Everyone say, come Holy Spirit. Anoint your servant. Help him to speak as he ought to speak. In spirit and in power. And Lord, anoint the hearers. Open our ears. Give us ears that hear clearly. Open our hearts. Take any hardness from our heart. And give us hearts that believe. That we might enter in. And lay hold of the things for which you've laid hold of us. We ask these things in the name that is above every name. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Um, The brothers are handing out uh, an outline that I've prepared. This is not a complete outline. It's very simple. And it's... it's, uh, very brief, but uh, I've prepared it so that, that it's, it will be easier for you to follow uh, my, what, what, I, what I'm saying uh, this morning, okay? Um, now, we don't have Jeremy here. He normally puts my, my points up on the board, so uh, I, I did a little extra work last night and prepared this for you. Um, how many of you know that I've, that I've got, and in fact, you may not know this, I've actually got four main headings in this message. And because I've not been able to get through all four points in one service, uh, we, we, we talk about part one, part two, and part three, and part four. That's just so you know uh, which day I'm, I'm on, okay? But there's four main headings, and then under each heading are some subpoints. That's why you'll hear me say first, and then I'll say first, under first. Or I might say second, and then I'll say first under second. I know it's confusing, isn't it? But anyway, hopefully this will, will help you. You don't need to start looking at it till I get to, to, to uh, the second page. So if you turn to the second page, and I actually have on there uh, my, my last message, the, the last point, the fourth point which I hope will, will give you some uh, anticipation, build some anticipation and excitement. Uh, I, I won't get to the fourth point until the Sunday after Mother's Day. So this next Sunday is the Come Up Here conference. And then the Sunday after that is Mother's Day, and you're going to love the message that I've, I've been preparing for Mother's Day. You know, I, I don't know if you're aware of it, but I, I have felt directed of the Lord, led of the Lord, to really give myself to prayer and to the preaching of the Word. So I've really sought to labor more diligently in my preaching than I ever have in my whole life. So I hope that you're being blessed by the ministry of the Word. All right, you ready? Don't start looking at the notes yet. To, to let me get through the introduction, all right? It, it, it's, uh, my introduction's on that, but if you start reading that, you'll miss it. <laughs> Let's pray again. No. <laughs> Amen. Amen. No matter what we do, 
whether it's bake a cake, build a birdhouse, build a happy marriage, start a family, build a business or career, run a marathon, eat healthy, or build financial wealth. No matter what we do, we must understand the rules or the principles involved. And we must pay whatever price necessary for excellence and for success. On Easter morning, we saw from the Scriptures that God the Father has established the throne of His Son. And He has made Jesus King. The past few weeks we've been learning that King Jesus makes specific requirements and even laws or commandments in order to ensure excellence or success in every area of our lives. In light of the fact that Jesus is King, we must understand how to live in order that we might please Him in everything. The first thing that we've seen, that's in my notes, the first thing that we've seen is that according to the Scriptures, God now commands all of us to kiss or pay homage to the Son. We saw that we do this by repenting or by humbling ourselves and getting ourselves baptized into Jesus' death and raised up into His life. When we do this, when we get ourselves baptized, we are forgiven and we are born again. We become sons and daughters of the kingdom of heaven. And once we've done this, then we can receive the Father's wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit who wants to come and live inside each one of us and help us live like Jesus and do the same kind of works that Jesus did. It's through water baptism that we're added to Christ and to His church. Second, we have seen, I'm dealing with my headings now, that the Lord Himself, once, once we have been added to Christ and His church, then the Lord, once we've been born again and added to Christ and His church, the Lord Himself puts us or places us in the body of Christ or in the church in an allotment of believers or a local congregation where we receive spiritual benefits of placement in the, the household or family of God. These benefits include spiritual fatherhood or pastoral oversight and care. They also include fellowship with Christian brothers and sisters and wonderful opportunities to minister and to serve the Lord in His kingdom with our natural talents and with our spiritual gifts. But we've also seen that in addition to benefits, there are also requirements and responsibilities. We have looked at three requirements. Up till now, we've looked at three requirements of membership in an allotment of believers. Number one, we've seen that we must be faithful together together with the members of our allotment on the Lord's Day. As together we go up to Zion and join with the saints of God around the throne of King Jesus in general assembly to worship our King, extend His scepter, and hear His word proclaimed. Number two, we've seen that we must be accountable to those who are over us in the Lord. Everybody say, oh joy. 
Hallelujah. We must be accountable to those whom the Lord has placed over us in the Lord, as well as those beside us in the Lord. Number three. Everybody say requirements. requirements. We're talking about the requirements of placement or membership in the, the family or the household of God. Number three, we must be faithful stewards of our money. How many of you enjoyed last week? Yeah. Now this morning, I want to direct your attention to requirement number four. And the fourth requirement... How many understand I'm still under the second major heading? But the fourth sub-point, okay? I'm, taking, I'm kind of laboring this because my wife said it was really confusing. And you know that I'm a good husband. I always obey my wife. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't want to embarrass her. The fourth requirement, if you're making notes, you'll want to write this down. The fourth requirement of valid placement in the kingdom of God and the household or family of God, watch this, is that we love and serve one another. This is one of my favorite points. You see, brothers and sisters, to kiss or to truly pay homage and submit to our king, you and I must obey his royal commandment, his royal law, that we love and that we serve each other. Is that not wonderful? Can you imagine how folks would be fighting to get into the church if we would do this? Obviously, to love and serve uh, one another those who, whom the Lord has, has joined us to, requires that we know where He's placed us in the family. Which means that we must not only know who is over us in the Lord, but also who is beside us in the Lord, and those, uh, those to whom we're joined or connected. Amen? Amen? I mean, no, you can't love or serve your brothers and sisters in, in the allotment, the place where he's placed you, if you don't know who they are. That's right. That's right. That's right. This also requires that we see one another or recognize one another in Jesus Christ as members of his body and as brothers and sisters in the the, the household or family of God. Remember, because we have been baptized into His death and raised up into His life, watch this, we have been united or joined to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And to one another in the Lord. How many of you are, are one spirit with Jesus? How many of you have been been baptized into Jesus Christ. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. That means you are one with Him. You're part of Him. Yes. And you are, are joined to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians, I'm taking you somewhere. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, and 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but you need to write these verses in your notes. The Apostle Paul commands the Christians in the city of Corinth to greet one another with a holy kiss. How many of you remember that verse of Scripture? Now, Paul was not talking about some erotic or sensual kiss on the mouth. Sorry, guys. Instead, he was talking about greeting one another with a brotherly or sisterly kiss on the cheek. The idea behind Paul's instruction is God's command 
in Psalm 2, verse 12. Kiss the sun, lest you perish from the earth. I talked about this in, in the, the, the first, in part one of my message, about how we kiss or submit to or obey the Son by repenting and getting ourselves baptized into Jesus Christ. Amen? I also shared with you that Psalm 2 verse 12, kiss the Son, is the idea behind the practice of liturgical churches as they kiss the rings of their spiritual leaders whom they recognize as representatives of the king. And thus, by kissing the, the rings of their, of their bishops and uh, of, of their overseers, they, they are, are indicating their homage to Jesus, the king. How many of you got that? Now, Paul's command to the Christians at Corinth to kiss one another had the same idea behind it. By kissing each other, these early Christians understood that they were kissing Jesus. They were kissing Jesus by kissing members of his body. Paul's command in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19 literally became the common greeting among Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Throughout the empire, Christians greeted one another by a kiss on the cheek because they saw one another as members of Jesus. They believed that by kissing one another on the cheek, they were symbolically kissing the Son and paying homage to and submitting to the King. Is that not powerful? How many believe that's probably a practice we ought to reinstate today? I mean, if you're too shy to kiss somebody on the cheek, maybe you could uh, shake hands or give, give your brothers and sisters a holy hug. It's interesting to me that, that this is still part of the liturgy of some of the ancient churches today. And it's called in the liturgy the, the greeting of peace. Amen? The question this morning, church, is how do we see each other? Now, how do you and I see each other here at the King's Church? Do we see each other after the flesh or in the natural or naturally? Or do we see one another after the spirit or spiritually? When we greet one another, do we see King Jesus, or at least a member of his body? How many of you see that if we did see one another in this way, it would make a difference in how we talk to each other? And probably make a difference in the way we treat each other. In John chapter 13, verse 34... John records that, that in the upper room, this is immediately after Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper or the meal of the new covenant. He declares to his disciples, this is uh, John 13 verses 34 and 35, if you want to get this in your notes. Listen to this. Remember, these are the words of Jesus. A new commandment. A new what, church? A new commandment. Let me see that loving one another is not optional. It's not just for those who want to be super Christians or super saints. It is a commandment for each one of us who are followers of Jesus. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you 
have love for one another. Now, the question this morning, church, is what was new about Jesus' commandment? After all, the commandment to love is really quite ancient. It's at least as old as the law of Moses. Because through Moses, God had commanded the children of Israel to love God and to love their neighbor as themselves. So what was new? Well, the new dimension found in Jesus' words are the words, as I have loved you. As I have loved you. You see, brothers and sisters, if you've been baptized into the death of Jesus, then you have been crucified with him. And you have died to your own self-centeredness and to your own selfish existence. And if you've been raised up into his resurrection, into his kingdom, and if you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit into your life, then you have been joined to Jesus and to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And you have received a new nature. In fact, as members of his resurrection body, as members of the church of Jesus Christ, you and I are now sons and daughters of Messiah's kingdom. We are members of the household or the family of God. And we are brothers and sisters. And we are commanded by our king to love each other in exactly the same manner that Jesus loved each one of us and laid down his life for us. Now what does this mean practically, church? Well, it means that we are to honor one another. And we are to prefer one another. Even more than we honor and prefer ourselves. I mean, no, that's a stretch. For most of us. It also means that we are to forgive one another. The offenses that are, that are, are done. And suffer and patiently endure one another's weaknesses and faults. I know none of you have weaknesses and faults, but um, some of those other Christians down the street do. Not only that, church, the way we are to love one another practically is by serving one another. Did you hear that? By serving one another. The gospel writers tell us that that there in the city of Jerusalem, in the upper room of the home of John Mark's mother, that after he had instituted the covenant meal, but before he had legally established the new covenant by laying down his life for us on the cross. Jesus arose from the table, laid aside his outer garments, took a basin of water, girded himself with a towel and washed his disciples' feet. Think of it. Just as a servant or the lowliest slave, Jesus the King washed the stinky, smelly feet of his disciples. Now what was the significance of that church? Of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Well, you know, there were no sidewalks in those days. No paved roads. No cars to drive people around. And because people either went barefooted or wore sandals, the washing of feet was actually a necessity in order to remove the day's dirt from the feet. This act of washing the feet was also needed to renew, to restore, to refresh the weary traveler. The washing of feet was a necessity, 
a necessary and important act of kindness and hospitality done to honor and make comfortable the person receiving the washing. And it's important to remember that this act was usually performed by the lowliest of servants or slaves. Now with these comments as the backdrop, look at John chapter 13 verses 12 through 15. You'll have to look in your Bible because Jeremy's not here to put that scripture up on the board. You're going to love this. John 13, verses 12 through 15. And so, and, and you don't have to turn to it, you can just listen. And so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments, that is, took, put them back on, and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. With, with all that was implied by that, with all, with all the ramifications that I've shared with you. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Is that not powerful? You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus is our Savior and our King. And in light of that fact, we're asking the question, how then shall we live? He saved us out of the devil's kingdom. He has brought us into the kingdom of God. He has made us sons and daughters of the kingdom of heaven, members of the household of God, the family of God, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And not only that, He has placed each one of us, in a specific allotment of believers, exactly where He wants us. Therefore, if we're going to obey and serve our Savior and King, you and I must love one another right here at the King's Church. And we must love each other just as Jesus has loved each one of us. Just as Jesus laid down his life for us, you and I must be willing to lay down our lives for one another here in this allotment. Many people have laid down their life for others. But for us as Christians, this command takes on a completely different meaning. Our military personnel, our firemen, our police are all aware that they may at some point have to lay down their life for others. But as Christians, our willingness to lay down our lives for one another must come out of our love and obedience to our King. As we honor, as we prefer, as we serve one another in His name, and by the power of His indwelling Spirit. You may recall recently on the news that a stranger, upon seeing a a man fall onto a subway train track, jumped onto the track, even though a train was rapidly approaching, in order to pull the stranger off the track and save his life. How many of you here saw that on the news? I recently heard of a husband who was hiking with his wife and a grizzly bear attacked the wife. So the man got up into the bear's face and began to aggressively stand up to the grizzly. And even as he was losing his life, the husband was shouting to his wife, Run! 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 
You and I may never be called upon to literally lay down our lives for each other here in the King's Church. But each one of us is still commanded. Yes, commanded by the King to lay down our lives by laying down our selfish will, our carnal desires, our plans, our time, our hard-earned money, our wisdom to the people that God has placed in our lives. I understand that some of the men in our congregation plan to move one of our families to another house this week. And whether they realize it or not, they are laying down their lives for someone in need. Yeah, they're giving up a Saturday after working hard all week. They're giving up their time, their muscles, which will probably, probably be complaining loudly after the move. They're giving their service as a practical expression of laying down their life for another. If you and I are going to follow Jesus, I mean, no, you don't have to. But if you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to follow His example, if we're going to kiss or pay homage to, if we're going to love and obey the King, then you and I must must recognize and love and honor and serve each other just as He has served each one of us. We must swallow our vanity and pride, humble ourselves, Gird ourselves with the towel of kingdom servanthood and serve one another in His name and for His glory. In the providence, in His providence, God the Father has given to each one of us here certain natural talents and abilities. And in addition to that, when you and I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit also distributes special supernatural gifts into our lives. If we would live our lives to please our King, then you and I need to use our natural talents and our spiritual gifts to minister and serve one another in the allotment or congregation where the Lord has placed us. That means, church, that if the Lord has placed you here at the King's Church, you need to find your place of service if you haven't already, and you need to do your part here. Recently, for seven weeks, I taught on the greatness principle, which was taught by Jesus. How to be great in the kingdom of God. If you missed the series, I encourage you to go online and watch the videos or listen to the podcast. What I want, I want you to think about the fact that Jesus, our King, in John chapter 3, declared that as folks in the world see us loving each other and serving one another, the way that Jesus loved his disciples and served him, then they will know we are his disciples. And they will also know that the Father has sent the Son into the world and that Jesus is indeed Lord and King. What a wonderful, simple, yet effective way to evangelize our world. Hallelujah. Now I come to my third main point. If you're making notes, you want to write down Roman numeral three, okay? As we consider the question, how then shall we live? Amen? How many, you know, I, I, I've talked with my wife about this. This may be the most important message that I've preached in this church since I've been here. 
because it's dealing with how we should live. Amen? In the light of the fact that Jesus has saved us, and in light of the fact that our Heavenly Father has made Him King of the world, the third thing we must do is kiss the Son or pay homage to it and obey the King, watch this, in our personal lives, in our marriages, and in our family relationship. Amen. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, but don't start reading yet. We'll read together. Ephesians chapter 5. In this amazing passage of Scripture, the apostle of Jesus commands that as Christians, followers of Christ, we should understand what the will of the king is. It for our personal lives, for our marriages, and for our families. And we should pay homage to, or submit to, and obey the king in these critically important areas of our lives. The first area that I want you to see is that by obeying the will of the king and pleasing him in our, 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 our personal lives, are you there? The first area I want you to see is that obeying the will of the king and pleasing him in our personal lives means that as Christians, as followers of Christ, we will live righteously and godly in this present evil age. Did you hear that? I'm talking about in our personal lives. We will live righteously and godly in this present evil age so that our lives shine as lights in the world. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 starting with verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5 starting with verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. How many of you are children of God? Wave at me then you, t- you should be an imitator of your heavenly Father. Verse 2, And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you, and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Look at verse 3. But immorality, or any impurity... Or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Verse 4. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral, and my Bible says one who commits sexual immorality, For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, how many of you are getting nervous? (laughs) Verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And the, the, the word translated comes is really a present tense verb. So it's in the process of coming upon the sons of disobedience. That's just an aside for those of you that care about doctrine. Verse 7. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And the the margin, my, my Bible has a marginal note there for verse 10. It says proving what is pleasing 
to the Lord. Or, or in other words, doing what is pleasing to the Lord. How many of you want to please the Lord? Verse 11. Do not participate in the unfruit. I'm, we're talking about the personal righteousness. Okay? We're talking about how, how, we, how, do we, how should we live in light of the fact that Jesus is... How should we live in our personal lives when nobody knows what's going on or what we're thinking or what we're doing? How shall we live? Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. Verse 14. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now stop reading for a moment. There's an old saying, like father, like son. Amen? Everybody say that with me. Like father, like son. You see, church, it's true that children tend to look like and act like their parents. They tend to imitate their parents, their, uh, their, their parents' lifestyle. Or culture. In light of that, if you and I are truly born of God's Spirit and His Word, and if we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and He's living on the inside of us, then we should look like and act like our Heavenly Father and like Jesus, our King. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Ephesians chapter 5. You're going to love this. 18 through 20. Well, let's begin with 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish... But understand what the, the will of the Lord is. I mean, you see, in light of the fact Jesus is king, you and I shouldn't be foolish. We need to understand what his will is. Verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine. And notice he doesn't say, don't drink wine. Amen. Smile. <laughs> What he says is, don't get drunk with wine. You know, if you have an intolerance for alcohol, then you need to use wisdom and you need to avoid alcohol. But just because you have an intolerance doesn't mean you should put that on the whole church. Don't shout me down. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Now, this is what I wanted you to see. But be filled with the Spirit. And the, the Greek verb there, translated be filled with the Spirit, is a verb that's, that means keep on being filled. In other words, having been filled, then keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. I mean, you see, that's what Pastor Sander was talking Becoming worshipers. Right. Hallelujah. Filled with the Spirit. And singing. And, and, and speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Amen. I mean, we shouldn't just worship on the Lord's day. Right. We ought to be worshiping all the time. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And be subject to one another in the fear of the Lord. Now stop reading again. Once again, just as in my second point a, a, a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about placement. I'm not talking about superficial or external righteousness. Did you hear me? 
Instead, I'm talking about, just like Paul, Paul is talking about an inner or heart righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, which you'll recognize is part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the sermon where Jesus teaches the laws of His kingdom and the principles of kingdom living. Jesus says, For I say to you, this is Matthew 5, verse 20, if you're keeping notes, making notes. For I say to you, talking to his disciples, he's talking to you and me, church. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that sounds ominous. I mean, my goodness gracious, church. You know, the, the righteousness, what I want you to see is the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees consisted of obeying more than 600 external rules and regulations. 600 rules. You know, how can our righteousness surpass 600 rules? Well, you see, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was all about externalism. Religious external. It was about religious customs and outward performance. Jesus, on the other hand, demands that we be born again and receive a new heart. Amen. You got quiet on me. In John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, we have the, John's account of how Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, who kept all these 600 rules, how Nic- and he was also a ruler of the Jews, he comes to Jesus by night. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, your external righteousness is not enough, Nicodemus. You must be born again. And Nicodemus was perplexed and he said to Jesus, what are you talking about? How can a man be born again? And Jesus said, you must be born of water. Talking about water baptism. And you must be born of the Spirit. Talking about receiving the gift, the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now what I want you to see, church, is the moment, watch this, the moment you repented, The moment you got yourself baptized into Jesus, you were born again. And your heavenly Father imparted to you a new nature. And when you received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the love of God the Father was poured out into your heart. Hallelujah. Through baptism into Jesus' death and resurrection, your heart has been made righteousness. And, and through, your, through, through uh, His resurrection, through baptism into Jesus' death and resurrection, your spirit, your human spirit, or your heart has been made righteous. Did you hear me? Yes. Hallelujah. In fact, your spirit is perfect. Amen? And nothing you can do, whether outward religious acts, religious conformity to the law of Moses, or the traditions of men, will make you any more righteous than you are once you put on Jesus in water baptism and you're born again. Now, you ought to be shouting at the top of your voice. You say, what are you talking about? What I'm saying to you is, Jesus has already done the hard part. (laughs) Amen? Amen. After we've been baptized into into his death and raised up into his life, and, and once we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit... Then, like Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, we simply need to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And we need to learn to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual 
songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. In other words, we need to become worshipers. Praise God. Praise God. Thomas Chalmers, a, a Scottish minister. Are you familiar with him, Jan? <laughs> he was a, a professor of theology and a leader of the Free Church of Scotland. Thomas Chalmers, are you familiar with him? <laughs> anyway, Thomas Chalmers called the process of sanctification or inner transformation the expulsive power of a new affection. The expulsive power of a new affection. Now, what did he mean? Well, he meant that as you and I fall in love with Jesus, that's the new affection. We will begin to change the way we think. Our attitude towards others will also change. And this will automatically change the way we talk to each other and the way we treat each other. Amen? Amen. This is what Paul meant by the phrase, the renewing of the spirit of the mind. The Apostle Paul understood that when we're born again, our spirits are perfect. Now, we still need to renew our minds. We need to learn to control our thought life and bring our thoughts, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we need to learn how to present our bodies as living sacrifices and discipline them by the power of the Holy Spirit unto good works. As we are continually being filled with the Holy Spirit, and as the love of God, watch this, as the love of God is continually being shed abroad in our hearts. And as we spend time in God's Word. And as we worship the Lord with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The psalms and hymns and spiritual songs become part of our lives. And part of our vocabulary. And we soon discover that we're in the process of being changed or transformed from the inside out into the image and the likeness of Jesus. Now I'm going to have to stop right there. Isn't that awful? Because it's ten minutes till and I can't get through this... Uh, the rest of my message in 10 minutes. How I many you know that's all right? Did you get anything out of this today? Yeah. Now, next week, I'm going to deal with, with uh, that we need to understand what the, the will of the Lord, in light of the fact that he's king, we need to understand how he wants us to, to, to relate to one another in our marriages yeah. and in our families. Yeah. Amen? And then you'll see in my outline that the last point, my fourth point is, in light of the fact Jesus is king, how shall we live in our relationship with the world outside? And I'm going to deal with how we relate to civil government, you know, our citizenship. I'm also going to deal with how, what, how, how we relate in the marketplace or the workplace, a kingdom work ethic. And then I'm going to deal with how we relate to those outside of Jesus. How we win souls. Yeah. And I'll be done with this series in on how then shall we live. You, don't, you, you, you must not miss this series. In fact, I talked to Brother Bradley on the phone uh, yesterday. And I shared with him about what I preached on Easter Sunday and then the, the sequel in light of the fact that God has made Jesus king, how shall we live? And I, I shared with him what the, the, the areas that I'm dealing with, and he's going to start showing the videos to his congregation. Amen. And I've, I'm in, encouraging all of our, of our uh, ministers, all of the, the pastors in our uh, apostolic uh, stream, network, jurisdiction, to do the same thing. 
Amen. How many believe Jesus is king? In light of that, how shall we live? How many of you believe he has a will for our lives? Hallelujah. 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 Let's stand together. Praise God. I'm going to ask uh, David and Inez to come. They'll share the, they'll be serving communion. Is there anybody here who needs personal prayer? You, you, you want prayer. Anyone? All right, then we won't have the, the, the ministry teams come forward. Uh, Kathy's gone to, to get the, the refreshments. We'll be uh, after communion. Then take time to enjoy the, the cafe and fellowship with one another. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that you would seal this word in the hearts of your people. Help us to not only understand that Jesus is king, but grant us the grace to be wise and to understand and know what his will is for our lives. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. 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 You're dismissed. God bless you.